Okay, everybody, I don't see the big crowd coming in this time. I guess that's good. I'm not as nervous then. Um, my name is uh, Tom Ballator. I am the director of the Lake Basin Action Network. It's an NGO. We're based in Japan, actually. I'm originally from Chicago. I went to Japan to do my PhD in engineering, University of Tokyo, and just sort of stayed for quite a while. It's been like 20 years now. Um, I formed this NGO about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago with three close friends. Um, the three of us were working on lake basin management, which means, I guess, catchment, watershed, drainage basin, whatever, but not so much the water itself, but rather the land around the water, because that's really where a lot of the problems actually occur um, from a lake perspective. So we decided that it would be a good idea to take some of the studies we were doing ourselves. You know, we'd have consulting jobs, we would be doing modeling, hydrological modeling, um, GIS remote sensing sort of work for different governments and agencies. And we figured the most effective way to sort of expand our reach with what do we want to do with our careers was to um, teach people in developing countries where they're having the most problems how to actually use the software themselves. So from the beginning, it's been a very sort of open source, free sort of approach. Um, this talk is mainly about questions. Um, I'll be presenting you um, some of the things we've been doing. We're very early, aid, very early stage with the Open edX platform. So please take a look at this, and I do hope to have time at the end for a lot of questions. Um, but very briefly about the Lake Basin Action Network. We are a group of, I think now it's about 20 people, um, different countries around the world, America, Japan, India, South Asia is pretty well represented. Africa, we have Morocco, Uganda, Kenya, bless you, Madagascar, and um, where's the other one, Malawi, and then a few in South America. Um, we do training in GIS software. Who knows what GIS is? I mean, you've heard of GIS, right? Okay. I mean, if you've used Google Earth, then you've used a form of GIS, right? Um, the stuff we teach is either, upon request, we teach the proprietary software called ArcGIS. That's the one right down on the side over there. Uh, or we also teach open source GIS. Um, for example, next week I'll be going to Guyana. No, Thursday I'm going to Guyana for three weeks to teach um, the government there how to use this program and that program, another remote sensing program called Beam, open source, uh, free, and, free and open source, um, to use uh, this software to monitor um, deforestation caused by artisanal mining, illicit artisanal mining. So these are sorts of uh, things that we teach. Now the software, this is a very sort of specific, uh, specific topic, and that's why I think the sort of audience we'll have in this course that we're developing, or courses we're developing, will be much, much smaller than um, the typical edX course. Like for example, the software itself, it's, uh, it's not easy to, you're not supposed to be able to read this. It's just to show you a screenshot of what GIS software looks like, right? You sort of got a map in there, you've got data, you've got layers on the left side, you've got a lot of tools that you can work with. Um, and it's, it's a bunch of layers that you sort of work through and do analysis on, okay? So it's, it has a very high learning curve, GIS software. It's getting much better. So we've gotten to the point where maybe, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people were working at maybe the command line. And that wasn't something you could go into a country and work with, let's say, middle-level people in an environmental agency or an agriculture agency and get them to be doing it themselves after only a few weeks of training. However, the software ma makers, um, both free and proprietary software makers, have really made it sort of a Windows-ified uh, experience now. So that's great for me because I can get people in a classroom, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, we can get people in a classroom and within maybe two or three weeks working intensely, we can get them up to a certain level of proficiency where they're comfortable to go back home or to stay at home if we're traveling to be with them. And then we can work with them in the future to expand their abilities. So it's not impossible to use. Um, this is another shot of just a different software we use called Beam um, for remote sensing. And again, there are a lot of options and that's great, but it's also sort of overwhelming. So, the issue is, you know, we've done most of our work so far in Africa. Um, it just so happened that we're interested in lakes, right? And we're interested in working in developing countries. And Africa has just a great number of great lakes, small and large great lakes. So we picked Africa as mainly our, just through our connections and through our previous work, what we're going to be doing. Now, 
we have so far, what is this? This was, uh, I forget the number, I think it's 16 or 17 countries we've worked in or worked with people from so far. Um, this is the network that I'll be talking about a little bit later that we're using to sort of test this edX uh, course that we're talking about. Now, the sorts of training that we do, uh, it looks like this. Um, if you go into the, the room, each country is different. You know, each room is different. This is a pretty nice room. Um, the photo is a little bit dark. I had to brighten it up a bit. Um, this was in Uganda last year. Um, the feeling is people sitting there with their computers. Everyone brings their own computer, right? We have to get them set up maybe on the first two hours in the morning if everything goes well, maybe the first four hours if it doesn't go well with the software. Um, and then we get people working, right? Usually what we do, uh, this is my colleague Shane in the picture there, um, what we usually do is in each case we take the, uh, a very important part here I forgot to mention, is not just the software but a major change that has happened in the last maybe four or five years is the free availability of data, right? Like the USGS, NASA have opened up the Landsat archive which is a satellite images from 1973 to present. Um, ESA, the European Space Agency, does the same. And pretty much anything you can think about in terms of importance for a lake basin, let's say population, um, you know, roads, uh, fires, many different things happening, protected areas. All these, you Google it, within a few minutes you're going to find a really nice data set at the global scale. That's just been a revolution that made things great. So we bring people these files because most of them can't download these. That's a very important issue later on, talking about internet speed and access. But we bring people files. We usually work on their own specific areas, right? So these guys were working on Lake Albert. It's a large lake. They've got oil exploration now in the lake, and they wanted to do some mapping for that. So we go in with the files for that. That was about a, this was a five-day program. So this was an advanced class. Um, and that was uh, good. You know, that's what it looks like. So we're walking around the room. We've got little lectures here and there. We show a demo. We have people do things. It's what people would call a flipped classroom, right? We're basically doing all the work there, and there'll be some readings for the night or something, if you want, about the theory. Very little theory, actually, but only as appropriate. I did the same thing earlier. Yeah, <laughs> I'm dry now. Okay, another one in Japan. Uh, this is our, our office. It's pretty much the same. Um, but we have a, a, a few people who aren't from Africa in, the, in this case. This is a few weeks ago. Um, the problem. Thank you. We need to reach more people than we're currently reaching, I believe. Right? There's a certain capacity limit on my time, on my colleagues' time, how many people we can reach. Right? We want to have a life beyond just training. Right? Um, and another thing, from that Uganda training, what happened maybe a few weeks after that, one of the very good students, he, he sends me an email, he's like, hey Tom, you know, there's a, a friend of mine looking for somebody who can train somebody in Africa with this open source GIS for forestry monitoring, would you be interested? Sure, why not? Um, and then he tells me, well, you know, where's it going to be? It's, uh, let's see, let me get that going here. So we've got, well, there's gonna be some training in Sudan, Oh, okay, so I Google Sudan and I see, okay, it doesn't look like, eh, maybe not a great place to go, but things have changed a little bit since a few years ago. Oh yeah, also uh, Eritrea, that's, uh, that's another one that's a little bit hard to get out of once you're in. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, Somalia, I'm going to have to think about that, obviously, I'm not going to go to Somalia. Um, and uh, we also had South Sudan and Burundi which happened to having a coup at the time. Now, this is my problem. I feel very strongly about bringing these sorts of tools to people, and my wife feels very strongly about me not bringing those tools to those people, right? Um, maybe at another point in my life, I would be happy to travel to these places, but I can't at this point. Um, and I cannot have my people who are working for me also do the same thing, right? Can't ask somebody if I'm not willing to do it myself. So, this was sort of the, the beginning of my thinking of, gosh, I need to have something online, you know, beyond just like a YouTube tutorial to show people how to do what we're doing. And that's very hard to replicate and it's been taking most of my time thinking how to get this translated from that classroom experience into a digital learning environment. That's where it's really hard for this, okay? A second thing, well, what I just said here is to replicate this collaborative in-person learning to the digital program. 
Now, around the same time, um, right after that, f completely different topic, I was using this GIS software. Um, I wanted to develop some things within it. And they have like two ways of doing that. One is a little model builder thing, kind of like Scratch, what we saw <coughs> this morning, right? Where you put things together, you link them together. And it's programming, and it's really easy, and you don't have to really worry about it, right? I'm great with that. But there does come a time when you need to actually use a formal language. And GIS is based on Python. And you know, I was back Fortran in the day, and that was a long time ago, and I don't really remember. So I decided, OK, I need to learn Python so I can do some more things with what I'm doing. So Google Python. And uh, Code Academy comes up, Khan Academy. No, it wasn't Khan Academy. Um, another one like that. And then, of course, edX. And it's got that, ooh, that MIT. That's nice, a little cachet, right? <laughs> And uh, so, uh, of course, you know, I logged in and I, I, I popped up the course. This was the sixth, well, I'll show you right here. I think one of the, the first ones that was out, the 6001X course, Computer Science and Programming Using Python. Now, until I took this course about a year ago, I had an uninformed yet negative opinion of online education stuff. You know, like we heard the talk today, um, you know, maybe college only two or three years or something. I loved college, right? Undergrad, five years. It was great. Two degrees. But <laughs> and then grad school and then even a PhD. It was a great time because, yeah, work is hard, right? And it's really nice to sort of, you know, stay in the academy, as they say. Um, and because I just love libraries and I love classrooms and I love that sort of atmosphere, I didn't think this would really work for me. This course completely changed my opinion because it captured some sort of essence of being a student. Okay? I felt like I was taking a course. It wasn't just signing up for something and then checking when I have a little free time. Right? Um, and I think that, at least in my mind, that's serving as a model for what I want to do. I've taken other classes since, and some have been really good, and some haven't been as good at motivating me to complete them. Okay? This one I did complete, and it was hard. Right? Um, and, and the reason it was so good is because, you know, you've got a professor there. You've got a few professors, Professor Grimson, Professor Gutag, um, looking at you, talking to you, explaining things in five-minute clips, seven-minute clips, just enough to digest but not get bored. And then after you're done with those clips, of course, you go to the little, I guess, multiple choice maybe, sometimes fill-in-the-blank sort of questions that are related to the clip. Everybody knows this about edX, right? So, but for me, this was new because it really meant that, okay, I listened to what I, I actually listened to the, the video that I was listening to, or I was looking at the notes or something, and I'm able to complete it. If I can't, I go back and learn it. That was really nice. And the hardest thing was, it's written there um, on the side, the problem sets. This is where it really sort of took off for me, and where I get the idea for my own um, work for this. You know, some of these problem sets take like 20 hours. Maybe for really clever, it's a few hours. It took me 20 hours, some people more. So, and the great thing about that was, you know, you're working on these things and you're getting closer and closer and closer to getting the things working and they have a forum. You know, you're talking to other students through the forum or with TAs through the forum. So, you know, you inevitably make a mistake, a semicolon instead of a colon or whatever, crazy things like that. And you're scratching your head for hours and you post something and somebody will help you in a second. So, that really reminded me of being down in the Union Building University of Illinois went to school, working with my study group, which is really how I learned as a student. So this course sort of had everything in terms of that that I was looking for. So um, what I decided is, okay, we've got to, I talked with Shane and Andreas, my partners, and we said, okay, we've got to translate what we've got right now into an online thing, and let's use Open edX. Okay, so that's the stage we're at right now. Now, the problems, right? Uh, it's not so easy when you're working in Africa with this. And the reasons are as follows. Well, I won't tell you the reasons first. We did a survey of 14 countries, people we have contacts with, um, and we asked them some very simple questions about logging into this, using this. What are your problems when you're actually using this edX course? Okay, so factors affecting the use of open edX in Africa for geospatial education. Any ideas? What do you think the number one complaint was? Anybody? Ooh, yeah, that was number two. Internet, bingo, number one. I feel like Family Feud, number three, anybody? <laughs> yeah, internet was the big one. Now, 
I'm sitting in Japan. I think it's the third highest internet speed in the country. I'll show you the, my, my speeds. It's, it's like here, right? A good university with good, nice fat pipes. It's great. I don't think about internet anymore, right? Um, my colleagues in Africa do. And it's not just simply the speed of the internet. It's that, well, you get interruptions to your service. And this is not a power issue. I'll talk about power in a second. But your provider goes down. Or other people are online at the time, so you just simply can't log in. Right? And it's not cheap. Right? Most people there are actually doing a lot of their stuff through mobile phones. Mobile phone banking is awesome there. Right? But to actually get large files to watch a video, that's almost impossible. Okay? So internet was one. That's right, the number one. Um, yeah, it's, uh, this is one of the best speeds we had. I don't know if you can see the numbers very well. But 2.86 megabits per second. Uploading almost impossible, and that's fine. Ping is very slow. That was from Uganda. Some people couldn't complete the speed tests. It just couldn't work, which is really just shows you that you're not even able to do anything with these platforms. Um, yeah, my speeds are something like that, which are, are decent, right? No problem at all. And, and if you look at the, uh, I got this, uh, the speed test company, they had a something, po something posted on Wikipedia about this, about speeds. And it reminded me of a, a figure we saw this morning about the open, what, no, it was the edX uh, providers of classes this morning. And Africa was like almost completely blank, right? And you understand that. I think they had Tanzania, South Africa, and maybe Egypt. There was like three classes or something. Um, this mirrors that in terms of internet access and internet access speeds. Um, Romania looks like to be the place to be. Romania and South Korea, I'm not sure why. Um, but yeah, it's a really big issue. Um, the second one, which somebody mentioned, thank you, is frequent power cuts. You know, this projector is not going to go off during my presentation, but that happens all the time in Africa. It happened a couple times a day. I don't know how the bulbs survive it, because you don't have a fan to cool you down anymore, right? Um, it's not just that. I mean, a projector going out is fine. We can continue talking. The problem is if you're downloading a video or a large file, you're cut off. If you're savvy and if you have a download manager, maybe you can get around that problem. But at least for the, the edX um, platform, that wasn't available in this course, the course that we're testing people on. Um, hardware is not as much of an issue as it used to be. Because everybody's got a laptop now. If it's built within the last three or four years, eh, usually pretty good enough for some of the stuff we're doing, for the, the actual software we're using. Uh, the more RAM, the better. At least four gigabytes is considered the minimum, but you can get away with two. Um, older machines, processors, that's, that's not so bad. Um, but one of the problems is, if you are working side by side, you're watching some video, you're streaming a video, and you're also working on the software, that's when you really get these sort of um, bottlenecks with the capacity of the hardware. Um, also, computer skills. This is something that always kind of shocks me. We, we're, maybe we're, what's the word for this, sort of naively hopeful about who's going to be able to learn and that sort of carries over and everybody is willing to put in the effort and learn the software in the courses we teach. But like I had a, a maybe a 50 year old man about two weeks ago at a course in Japan. He didn't know really about copying and pasting. Okay? He could check his email, he could do things like that. And if I mentioned it to him, he could he'd look around, hunt and peck. He couldn't blind touch, obviously. I, is, that, is that a word? Um, he couldn't touch without looking at the keyboard. But you know, I'd say control C, control V, things like that. So we do have users. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because in a classroom, ah, that takes me a second. I just go over there, no, you, you'd like this. Yeah, right click, okay, drag it there, okay, release. Oh, now he's got that skill. How am I going to do that online? <sighs> it's not easy, right? Um, a few more issues before I get to the, uh, the conclusions here. Um, credentialing is very important. Okay? I was actually happy when I got my certificate from that course because I spent so much time on it. Posted on Facebook, all like, ooh, MIT, cool. But for these people, when you go back to your job, you say, okay, I actually did a course. If I forget to prepare certificates before I go to one of these places, that's the first thing I have to do. Right? It has to be signed, something printed out that you get officially that says you got this skill now. That's why you were spending five, ten days, whatever, two weeks somewhere. So that's really important. And I think the current way of doing it is fine with PDFs, but there has to be something where sometimes it has to be physical, at least in my experience. Um, 
Also, language and culture. Uh, working with different languages is a problem for obviously everyone here. Africa, I know it's 800 different languages, I think. Obviously, most people are going to be speaking English or French or Portuguese. Um, so that's not such a big issue. But again, um, working with, maybe this is uh, part of our, our mission that we need to rethink, but we try to go to any level of person who might benefit from having access to this technology. And that means people who aren't very familiar with computers, maybe people who aren't very literate, actually, but who do map things. So we'll often do exercises where we have a physical map, just like a, a piece of paper with post-its and markers and drawing on a board. And then we work with people to actually translate that into a geo-referenced map. Right? So that's challenging, and it would be even more challenging online. Um, final thing here, and this is where I'm, I'm really stuck right now with the, the course creation. Um, is obviously videos are a problem because they are heavy even if you really really downscale them and try to make them light right um, but I think they're very important although some people are saying I was at a solve meeting last week in, at MIT and they were talking about well you know looking at completion rate on these courses actually people get certificates a lot of those people it was maybe a majority hadn't watched the videos is that possible? I guess so. For me, the thing that was so great about it was actually the videos. Because, hey, there's a professor. This is like feels familiar, you know, from my experience. Okay, a problem set, that's okay. Apparently, a lot of people don't need it. So maybe I need to sort of reset my own um, preconceptions about what's important based on my learning style. Um, of course, it has to be multiple choice or fill in the blank things. These are all obviously doable. Problem sets are fine. The one problem I have is the evaluation of geospatial outputs. We have, you know, if you ask somebody to, let's say, make a, a lake drainage basin file, they're going to come up with a shape file or a raster, whatever it's called, and they're going to have to post that. It's not like something you can automatically check, right? Um, these are very large files that require somebody to look through them and see if they're right or wrong. Maybe if I was really clever, I could have some sort of machine learning to go through a lot of things, but at this point, we're looking at maybe, at most, a thousand people interested in these sorts of courses, maybe more, hopefully. Um, but that's something I'm going to be have to doing with my colleagues. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I already talked about this briefly. Um, I guess my final slide is help. Not just anybody, but I need help. Um, and that's what I, I was really hardened in this, uh, this, this uh, plenary this morning when the gentleman was saying, you know, hey, talk to us about this. Because we're in this early stage. Um, we, have a reason for be doing, we have a reason to be doing this. I think it's a good reason. Um, and we're going to do it. But there's a lot of technical issues. And I'm just curious. And I've left, I think, about five or six minutes for some discussion at the end here, maybe in the hallway, too, if possible. But how would you guys get over this? I mean, obviously, you've, many of you have dealt with these issues before. I'm just curious. OK? So that's the end of what I wanted to say. So thank you. Okay, questions, please. Yes, right in the back. Yes, you mentioned the problem of interconnectivity. Have you actually tried running this course or having your contacts? We use the 6001X as a model. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it re actually reminded me of a, a, a point from, from last week at this meeting I was at. They had people from Google, from Facebook, and from a few uh, satellite companies. And they were talking about having this new sort of global, by 2019 or 2020, like global internet access, free for anyone. Um, it sounds kind of crazy, um, but I think it's something that might take care of a lot of these issues, the way they were talking and making pledges for this. There's supposed to be some UN meeting on this next year. Um, governance is going to be a problem with this. But yeah, bringing you know, higher speeds to anybody, even in the field, because it's coming from the sky, essentially. But thank you for that good point. Yes, and, uh, a follow-up? Sorry, yeah, follow up. So yeah, have you talked with like, your contacts with the country about the possibility of using 3G on their tablets on their phones to take the course? And do they know that that's like, even an option? Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously 3G and then 4G will be possibilities there. Right? I haven't tried it yet, but we have to try that. Yeah, that's a good point. OK, uh, point please, and then we'll go over here. Uh, so have you thought about just shipping the whole thing over? Yeah. Just like on from there with the laptop? Uh, yeah. There's, I mean, you know, like there are tools for like, basically having a virtual machine that runs the entire shipping app. You can just send it there, and then they can just run it from your machine. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is one option. I do send, actually related to that, I send satellite images a lot. Um, I've got like uh, 200 gigabytes. I'm taking a guy on, a, on Thursday on a disk and just give it to him. It's the fastest way. It's the fastest way. Absolutely, yeah. But it's so distributed. Um, I have to think about that. Yes, good. Uh, and you, you were first over here, please, and then over there. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, I'm. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. I, I guess it was, so overcoming with language and things like this. So obviously, you have you have a solid set of partners that you work with. And sure. And yeah. I'm very lucky that the sort of world I work in is this sort of academic NGO feeling where it's no people don't think about money first, right? It's first of all, I'll translate that for you. If we can get a project to pay for it, that's great. Um, if not, that's usually not a problem. I'm very blessed with that, yeah. Question, please? Uh, same question. Uh, same question. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I should, um, oh, here, let me get back here. The, uh, the students themselves, that's, that's a thing I, I really didn't mention explicitly, but most of the people we deal with are um, sort of mid-career professionals looking to gain new skills. Um, occasionally, we'll have a university student, but that's usually not our target. It's people who are actually working with policy. They're charged to go out and enforce some law, but they don't know how they're going to find somebody who's doing something, maybe. Yeah. Oh. Doesn't have regular internet access. Well, they have. Well, what do you mean by regular? That means they, they. Of course, they can check their email. They have a phone, but the power is going out. The provider might go out, and the access is going to be very, very slow. So that's the problem. Yeah, but most people will have access of some sort. Sure, it would be impossible without. I did have one guy in Chad we're working with that he's really got trouble finding access. Yeah, there was one right over there. Yeah, and then beh and then behind you. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, video and how perhaps they overcome videos and whatnot. Have you experienced other things where you found a challenge to differentiate content, perhaps uh, the material is taught with a certain culture in mind, but you know that also it's not just about the language but also the culture of the context that you speak. Yeah, that that's really a good a good point because we come up with two minutes five, uh, privacy issues in terms of the data. Um, the biggest country I've had trouble with is actually in India um, with mapping of borders because of disputes with other countries. And I can get out of the country if I show a map, maybe drawn with the wrong border, but I have to be very, very careful with my colleagues because um, it's a law that you can't draw a map with a certain kind of border or without a certain kind of border on it. And that's serious stuff that we have to be, um, but I don't think it's really a cultural issue, it's more of a legal issue. Um, no, I don't know. Um, we're moving into also starting to work with uh, the UAVs, the drones, for especially cloudy areas. That'll be another place where you know you get a lot of sort of privacy or I don't know what sort of concerns those are, but they're definitely there. Good point. And, and behind you in the hat, sir, I think it was. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that the OG scientists here are interested in the UAVs and working on it, and it's an advanced project. But you know, we're not that's great, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, hey, is that you? No. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm from the Foundation from Georgia. Ah, okay. We work together on a project called X2Go. We put edX on a small hardware and put courses on it to give people access. Let's talk after, okay? <laughs> yeah. All right, I think I'm at time, right? Okay. Hey, thank you very much for the very good input. I appreciate that very much. Thank you.